Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Arkham Horror Podcast, in quotes, on our channel. We haven't done one of these in a while. Uh, this is just kind of like our, our free-form discussion about all things Arkham. Uh, if this is your first time on the channel, I'm Justin. I play Survivor. Travis, why don't you introduce yourself so people can know who your voice is. I'm Travis. I play Seeker and other things, too. And Bryn? I'm Bryn. I play bad cards. <laughs> uh, yeah. Assuming that Dunwich Legacy is like the furthest along the, the line you've you've come, it's definitely bad cards. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise known as green. Well, what, what was a notable yeah. rogue card? And like uh, that was a what? Like liquid courage, I guess. Double or nothing. That card. The only that card, card that's completely banned. Was that's true. One? This is like the good card. This is like the good card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the Dunwich Legacy came out years ago, but it's been recently repackaged. So today we want to talk about the that expansion because we played with it when it first came out, and it was honestly like huge. Uh, there are going to be some spoilers in here because I'm going to be talking a bit about the campaign because that's where I live the most in this game but when we played the house always wins for the first time i was absolutely floored about what this game could do and i was like this game is incredibly sick at this point now the campaign yeah it's probably my least favorite it's really actually dependent on that and insmith just because for some reason i just don't like insmith right now but um with dunwich i just that first experience, the blind playthrough of Dunwich was absolutely incredible for me. Yeah. So, with this then, like, what do you, uh, like, what, what do you think was, like, the most memorable part? Like, I want to just talk about, like, start with the memories. Like, for you guys, what was, like, the most memorable bit, like, when we were first playing back there with Dunwich? Because, like, to me, it's, like, Getting new player cards, obviously. Seeing things like like prepared for the worst as well. That card kind of just like changed the game when we were just starting out because we could actually like get weapons. Like, <laughs> what was like a big stuff for like you guys when we were just when we first started getting into that set? Uh, yeah, like prepared for the worst was pretty big. The new player cards, uh, some of the scenario designs were re like just having more game to play was really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And, like, having actual decisions for, like, making our decks and stuff mm -hmm. was pretty huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was mostly just, like, the... Like, actually having decisions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, on our, our Patreon, I've been re-watching our first blind run of Dunwich to see, uh, to give, like, play-by-play -play on the stuff we used to do back then. And seeing us use the going back to double or nothing, seeing us use double or nothing fairly, it was kind of, it was really fun to see, right? Like when the card existed in a good space, right? Like as Bryn used it to shoot and deal four damage to um, a conglomeration of spheres before the card got absolutely busted open and it was just like deal extra damage. Um, it was fun to see that. Yeah. Um, the other thing Let's, to, sorry? I was going to talk about the scenarios next. If go you're, for it, uh, go for it. Yeah, we got to, like, they did a lot of really neat things, which, like, we kind of look a bit down on some of the Dunwich Legacy scenarios now, mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, literal years of experience and playing through them probably a dozen times each. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they definitely have their design flaws that shows from the early parts of the of the game but there uh someone did some really neat thing it's the, the it, it was fun to explore the miskatonic museum for the first time uh you know the twist in the essex county express was spooky um yeah that was, I did a great job of pacing i feel like we didn't really appreciate blood on the alt the first time no no we played I, it I maybe in the that. first couple of times yeah yeah, the, the this may, having like story decisions to make, especially at the start with which doctor we were gonna go find, mm -hmm. 
was cool. Um, on Dimension Unseen, even that one wasn't quite the slog it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time we played it, though, it did take us a long time. Where Doom Awaits was... I actually don't remember the first time we played that one, so it must have been pretty uneventful. Yeah. And I do remember <laughs> Lost in Time and Space was like, wow. Yeah, that was a cool finish. And, like, mm -hmm. being, like, just seeing how things were different. Like, the game changed because we're in space. And then also, like, a big thing, too, was hitting that climax where we actually got to, like, go face-to-face -face with, with, uh, with an ancient one. Because we played a lot of Arkham uh, Second Edition. We played a lot of Eldritch. And, like, that's kind of the game, right? But you don't get that in Arkham. You get those smaller stories. Mm -hmm. So, actually, like, I remember when the spoiler article was released... And they talked about uh, Yog Sothoth, and I was like, "It's the guy! We finally get to see him!" <laughs> right? And it made it like feel like a climax to the campaign. Yeah. <clears throat> so, like, that's that's one thing too. Like what Travis was saying, how like on our channel now we are hard on it, but like it's still a really good, like. Like, if you're just getting into the game now and you've picked up the revised core and you're picking up Dunwich, even if you played something like, um, like, Forgotten Age, Circle Undone first, like, any of the other ones, like, there's still stuff to appreciate in Dunwich. And I think what I, what I personally appreciate most in Dunwich is the simplicity of the campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I actually miss it. Like, it was just, <laughs> like, the scenarios were just so simple and they told such a story without having to do like even like like essex was a very simple scenario with a very scary hook right like the hook is what makes it interesting the train's getting sucked up behind you and you got to go fast like sure it's not the most perfectly designed because there's situations where people get sucked up on the first turn right but it's still just nice and simple and i kind of miss that part of it yeah yeah, I, I also miss when every campaign didn't have... You weren't adding and taking tokens out of the bag from like a separate <laughs> pool, and you didn't have to worry about... You weren't, like, in a, a fucking car driving. and like, <laughs> like, man, I just want to play the game, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, 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 it's good that they do experiment with the design, right? Because otherwise... Yeah, I just wish they would, like, experimented, like, a little bit, bit less, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They just give us a actual basic like searching for Lena Harper one in Smoke, not here to rip on Innsmouth in particular, but that one could have pretty easily been like a just you just look around town. You didn't have to play clue and like potentially get screwed out of half the scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually one thing that like it's I've found too is that with sometimes like when they do have these hyper design scenarios, you kind of have, you have to play it that way. Right. But I like mm -hmm. playing Arkham and I don't want to have to be forced. To, it's like, it's like a railgun shooter, right. Where you're just set on a path and you have to shoot. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a bit more fun to be able yep. to explore the map and uncover the map. I do think edge of the earth is um, better for this. This is the most recent campaign at the time of the recording. But, like, for me, I look at the giant maps. And even, like, taking out the fact that, like, I have to fit it all on a camera. So, like, to me, I have a very special problem with it. I still, like, I... Those... the To me, Edge of the Earth, it would be perfect if the maps were just slightly smaller. Just slightly. Because they're ginormous. And, like, <clears throat> this is where I look at Dunwich. <clears throat> and I, I really like it in the simplicity, but also just the fact that... Like, the maps are just explore the museum. Explore the the quad, right? Explore scary Dunwich, right? It's just, like, it's really nice and simple. Yep. No, I, I really appreciate that about this campaign. It's very... Most of it is very low scale. Like, I don't mind the big maps in... Uh, mm -hmm. the, the big maps in Edge of the Earth are... They're cool because, like, that's what Edge of the Earth is. You're in Antarctica. Yeah. There's nothing else. It's just this vast wasteland for you to explore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then, like, especially on the heels of Innsmouth that had, like, you had two kinds of maps in that one. You had the, the, basically the ones where you're playing the designer's minigame, and then you had the ones with just these absolutely colossal maps 
that were like you know 16 to 20 locations or whatever and those ones are just like eh. it's like having those two side by side was a little bit tough they've been uh, spread yeah. out more i think would be a little less critical of it but that's fair i do hope i i guess yeah that as well as i hope <clears throat> that like <clears throat> like when you see magic the gathering when they release a new set they have like the design goals for that set right and i would love to know that if they had these similar design goals when it came to the campaigns for Arkham, if they were like, Edge of the Earth, we're going to particularly focus on big maps, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, my my personal one that I actually have liked the most looking back at Edge of the Earth is the one where you're just climbing the mountain and it's on, like, a straight line with, like, six locations, right? Because it tells such a story there. And, like, it works well because the other ones are so big but if all of our campaigns are have huge maps that's kind of like then then what's the point right like where's the the variety to make it fun so like i do wonder if like when they start a campaign if they're like so these are our design goals for this campaign these are like this is what like we're hoping the campaign to be right like curious to know how that mm -hmm. kind of stuff works mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like a little more design. I mean, do get like a little blurb at the end of the campaign, mm -hmm. and so they talk about their designs for them. But they, they don't talk too much. They talk about mostly like what parts of the mythos they were looking yeah. at, yeah. exploring and stuff like that. They don't mm -hmm. talk quite so much about the design mechanics. Uh, I would like to see, but no. um, yeah, you guys want to go like scenario by scenario and talk about stuff? Yeah, sure, sure. Or you want to do, you want to do the player cards first? I guess with Bryn, uh, we should ask you, Bryn. Like, what are your like general thoughts like from now till then for Dunwich? Because this is mostly Travis and I. What do you do? You have anything to <laughs> add to this? Yeah, uh, most mostly like the jump from the core set encounter to this one is huge, mm -hmm. but the jump from this one to Carcosa is like also kind of huge. Like we get to see all kinds of new stuff and get beaten to death with, by a guy with a lead pipe in a <laughs> river valley. You know, yeah. Stuff happens. Um, yeah, like th I think this one does suffer a little bit from being the first... Mm -hmm. the first one. Yeah. Because there are definitely parts of it where it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, they don't do things this way anymore. Yeah, definitely. Because it's not as good. All right, Travis, why don't you lead our conversations about... Let's go through scenarios first. We'll do the scenarios. We'll start there. Scenario by scenario. Uh, sure. So we got uh, House Always What We'll Do First. Mm -hmm. uh, what we like about I, this one. It's a unique concept. Yeah, I um, personally really like the intro to this scenario. And then I like how it shifts into traditional Arkham in the latter half of the scenario. Um, mm -hmm. The gambling, while at this point, can be kind of tedious. Um, the first time through, it was really cool. But I still enjoy the gambling side of it. Um, but at this point now, it's like usually you gamble less, right? Like you, you do the drinks, you sell someone to the mob. Um, <laughs> And then you just like grab your last two from gambling because you grab the two off the top. But I love the like the flavor of it and the mechanics of it. Um, yeah, that's from what I think. Yeah, I agree with I, I agree with most of that. Mm -hmm. um, the gambling could be like a little like I understand why it is like a tough thing to balance for them because you know you can. The gambling itself can be frustrating, and it sucks to have, like, the scenario sort of depend on that, right? Mm -hmm. But then... Uh, uh, you can't introduce too many measures to mitigate it, because, like you said, especially with turn two, it's kind of like you don't really gamble at all anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, just, you sell your guy, you, you buy your clues, and you move on. Mm -hmm. Gamble once or twice, and um, yeah. And also, I hate that one location at the end that you technically can't get the victory off of. Yeah, yeah that does feel anyway. bad. We got all the clues. It's, this is something that I've I, I I've also kind of just like thought about. Like, I wonder if this was 
a specific design intention to let you walk away, or if they added the resign rule later, and then they were like, oh, this just me messes this up now. Because it's, to me, one of those rules that I think someone just learn about, learns about, and then they're like, oh, it, like, it makes sense why it's there, but, like, that location shouldn't have victory. Like, you could argue that, like, it can mean that someone goes there first, grabs the clues, and then goes somewhere else, right? But I still just, I don't know. It's just, it's always been very weird to me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it was just an oversight, just a mistake on their part, because we haven't seen anything else like that, and there isn't anything else like that in the campaign. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, no, it's, um, but I love the second half of this camp. It always stresses me out. Even though it's the first scenario, like, I actually, like, it's, this is one of, the, like, like, this one, Curtain Call, the, it's actually, like, the Forgotten Age, and then the Witch one. Like, those are, like, the most of the, actually, scratch that. Most of the first scenarios actually have, like, a really good stress point to them, except for the Dream Eater ones, and then also for me, Edge of the Earth. But, like, I think this is, like, one of the biggest stress scenarios for me, so much so that, like, if anyone asks me my opinion, I never want to do this one second. I always want to do it first, because mm -hmm. it's, it's harder to do it second. Like, uh, extracurricular is a lot easier to do second. Um, but like this one is like, even can be potentially stressful because like, there's some heavy enemies, which I can maybe find through this. If I just scroll through, we'll get there eventually. I just don't want to search the name because I, I mean, I know its name conglomeration of spheres. He haunts my dreams, man. <laughs> just, yeah. uh, you just got to bring not, uh, not a melee weapon. It's true. Yep. But that's okay. Cause the game, the. Uh... Campaign's going to reward you for that down the line, too. Yeah, it is. It is. And actually, that is kind of cool that, like, I I like that this one has that, right? Where you see, you're looking at this thing with your machete and you're like, well, that's garbage, right? But it's still just, like, if you just shoot it with a gun, it solves that problem. And exactly that, like, it, the campaign then later, when you get to the birds, it's like, congratulations, you've done it. You broke the code. Yeah. You figured it out. And they never do something like that again. That's not true. <laughs> they do it again in the next campaign. For the ghost, right? Yeah, the poltergeist. Yeah. Spooky. The poultry ghost. Yes. You're telling me there's a chicken in this game? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, next scenario is extracurricular activity. Um, one thing I'll never forget about this one is the first time we drew that card, um, uh, that you, if your deck's empty, you take 10 damage. Oh, yeah. I'll get, I'll get there that eventually. I don't remember the name of that one. But just seeing, is it like, oh, I don't even know. But just seeing that for the first time, I was like, excuse me? Like, at this point, at that point in the game, uh, and actually this is something that I've, I know there are people out there who are going to, who disagree with this, but I feel like card draw is just, the like, deck cycling is just a bit too much right now. Um, because obviously yeah. when Dunwich was out, they were, beyond the veil, there it is. They were like, um, this is just, this should be scary and you like, the game was designed to only cycle through the deck once. And this is like the example of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And this was scary the first time we saw it. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to watch the... Because I haven't got to the extracurricular in my play-by-play um, -play watch through yet on Patreon. But I'm excited to see our reaction and who is the one who drew it first. And just like the... I, I'm, I'm curious because at this point now I draw it and I'm like, this was not an encounter card, <laughs> right? Like, this is not that scary. I have plans for it. But back then, it mm -hmm. was terrifying. Oh, yeah. 10 damage was a lot back then. Yeah. I like this review for the card that says, One of the worst design cards in the game. Treachery cards that give you no recourse to deal with them are a design flaw. <laughs> Apparently, this person's still scared of it. I mean, they're, did they they're post that? Uh, 
Um, and this one can still potentially, like, I suppose that, like, this one also, I, I like extracurricular activity uh, in that, like, it still puts you in this headspace where you kind of have to play around beyond the veil, right? Like, at a certain point, you're like, okay, I'm going to stop drawing cards because we haven't seen them beyond the veil yet. So, like, it's still kind of there, but it's not um, as spooky as it once was. I think it's just a cool... I think it's a cool scenario. I don't think it's, like, a great scenario, but I still... I still enjoy extracurricular activity anytime it shows up. It's, it's like... Uh, yeah. It's a fine scenario. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I do like how it had multiple ways to win the game. Mm-hmm. It's nice showing that off and, like, not knowing whether... They did actually have uh, repercussions later. Yep. Yep. Which was neat. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it the first time that we had like, like multiple win conditions, and then, uh, that like mattered in the future. You, you did have them at the end of Night of the Zealot, but like that was the end of the campaign. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you don't blend Night of the Zealot into other campaigns? I think Travis is actually doing that right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have a little experience with that is all it makes up their campaigns really, really easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what is it like you were you were telling me if you're ever gonna play uh, a run where you run with the same deck until the end, you get an observed just to hit the thing that heals trauma as a chance, right? Yeah. 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 She's the game. Never uh, die. Mm -hmm. Next scenario, Miskatonic Museum. Mm -hmm. This one has like a, a fatal flaw to it, but pretending like that doesn't exist, it's a neat scenario. Yeah, I like the mood on the scenario a lot. It's really creepy. Um, mm -hmm. And even, I like it as a kluver. I think it's very fun as a kluver. You just have so many clues to gobble up. And you can convince yeah, your that's all you have to do. Yeah, and you can convince your goon to spend your clues to open up the thing. So it's like, because they have nothing else to do. Um, I I do think that, like, once again, ignoring the design flaw, I do think that it has the, uh, the, the scariest kind of um, blind play. Because you, you the enemy shows up, and in your mind you're like, I kill it, stab it dead. And then it shows up again and it's bigger and you're like, wait a minute, something's wrong, right? Um, but unfortunately, that design flaw of the fact that your goon does nothing for the majority of it kind of sucks. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have much more to say about that one. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not too flashy or anything like that. It's just fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you, Bryn? I think Bryn might be stepped away. Got a message from him. Okay. So, Essex is next. Um, yeah, this one can, like, really just beat it to you. But, but you it's know, a fun scenario. I like know, it still. I kind of also like that it can just feed it to you. Yeah, it's got, like, a super... The punishment for it's, like, super soft. Yeah. And while it feels bad, if once you realize what the, the punishments are, you just kind of like a... Yeah. Like... It, it might, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm right there with you. Like, if I get sucked up on the first turn, that's just Lord of the Rings level luck, right? Like, sometimes you just die. And if that happens, yeah. just mulligan. Just do it again. Like, who cares, right? If you get sucked you up and you're like... You mulligan for this one. If you, get, if you get sucked up this one, what, you get like, what's it, through the veil weakness or something? Yeah, something like that. It's like some... Here, one second, I'll get it on the screen. I think kind of set up, but yeah, because like I think just it's if you get sucked up like halfway through, just live with it. Like it's fun. It's like the game. Like it's just it's what it does. And like yeah, you get you get a weakness that's like revelation mill three. Who cares? <laughs> there it is. Like, yeah, yeah. Across space and time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's just. The, the, I think like people, they get more salty about the fact that they have, um, set up the game and then died on the first turn. If you die on the first turn, just who cares? 
Like we've it's mulligan. Bad. We've mulliganed a whole entire scenario before because we like we were just like we thought that we got a bad go at the beginning, right? If yeah. you get sucked up halfway through, that's your fault, not the game's fault, right? And then if you get sucked up, just take Probably. your cross space and time and be happy that you get to play this card that just lives in your like storage box for ninety five percent of its life. Yeah. Yeah. It took most. It mostly even does nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And like. I really like the um, like the cult rituals, and then like the feeling when a cultist appears and it's on the back of the train, and it's going to cause that train to get sucked up. But you're like two cars ahead. Like the storyline of you guys looking back there, seeing the cultist, he laughs like maniacally, then gets sucked up into space, and you're like, "Well, he's fucking dead." It's just fun. Like it's a very pulpy scenario. Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. All right, what's next, Travis? I think we can go to... Uh, on the altar. Yeah. <laughs> Kidnaps, not Duke. <laughs> not Duke. <laughs> Honestly, it's kind of surprising we dodged that the first time through. Just Duke didn't get kidnapped? That would have been sick. That would have been a great moment on our first time through. <laughs> that would have been incredible. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite thing about Blood on the Altar is that somehow every time we've played it, Earl Sawyer got sacrificed. <laughs> Yeah, that was that's kind of wild. Yeah, Earl Sawyer. Uh, I think I, I love this scenario though. I've talked about this a lot on our other videos, but the mood on this one is absolutely crazy. It's very dreadful. It's really fun. It feels like a classic horror movie, and I just I like a lot about it. You get to the basement. There's this scary flesh monster. It's just a really good scenario. I think. No, I agree. And it also has, like, some of the cards that hit the hardest, but, like, you don't feel like they do until they start hitting you. Like, I love Psycho Pomp's song. I think the design on this card's really good. Yeah, that, I mean, that card's actually kind of brutal. It is, yeah. That damn and bird. it's got Surge. And it's got Surge, yeah. Why wouldn't it? It doesn't do anything, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spoken like someone who's never been killed by it. Killing other people. Have you been killed by a Bryn? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one in my in my threat area. Travis gave me a second one, and then I just right. Exploded. Yeah, I remember that. That's what. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I remember. That one, yeah. yeah. Good times. <laughs> Travis I was is like, you don't think that you did. You were like, Bleh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and then I like, because uh, then in like, uh, what I like too is that the Whippoorwills, the classic Whippoorwills, everyone loves the goddamn Whippoorwills, right? But mm -hmm. that like, they came back in Circle Undone, and like, they used the design and then they turned it into uh, also a horror one, which is really cool. Um, and I think they should be. I think Whippoorwills are some of the, I love the design on these guys, these damn tweet tweet birds. They are quite good. Yeah. Yeah, like an enemy you don't have to actually kill, but like you probably should. And they're gonna be real. They're gonna be annoying if you don't, and they're just a pain to deal with. Yeah, and like and you always have you like you're looking at the one in the tree, and you're like you're not a problem. But then suddenly someone draws a second one at your location, and then everyone's like, oh fuck, there's two birds on that <laughs> tree. This is a problem. Yeah. We can't even kill them now. Yeah. <laughs> I do love how you can just shoot these things with uh, the coup de gras. Yeah. Just like, off the hop. They show up and you're like, oh no. Coup de gras here for people who don't know. Yeah, deal one damage to enemy location. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just shoot yeah, the right? bird out of the tree. Like... <laughs> I also love that like, um, like Zoe can just like, if you have her cross out, it's just like, bye by right i like that there was like there there's the stuff there like there's these interactions that are particularly noteworthy like obviously like zoe's good with any one health minion but like these surprises and strategies were being able to found in just the dunnage box that it came in yeah yeah tweet tweet eager for death 
Scary birds. I love them. They're just so fucking cute. <laughs> Um, what was next, Travis? I know what it is, but I'm just asking for YouTube's sake. The Undimensioned and Unseen. Everybody's favorite. Goddamn birds. It's not... They're here for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but sometimes you're here for ten minutes. Yeah, and and you just get roughed up. You just walk. get roughed up so bad that you're like, "Cool, I guess we just leave now." There's yeah. um, I've seen a lot of people comment whenever we release a new video of this scenario where they just say they just actually just resign because the downside of them escaping is very minimal, right? They just are like, "We're not even going to play this one. We're just going to go." Um, I just think that like I this is one I never look forward to, and I think it's just because. There's one way to play, and the guys just are too big. They're just a bit too big. Um, however, it's fun to waylay them, <laughs> because yeah. they're not elite. Um, but then you're like, I just think, yeah, no, that I don't like Undimensioned and Unseen. I don't have much positive to say about it, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the return to does fix some of my gripes. It does make it one. less tedious. Yeah. Where there's like a little bit more going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get Sonic. Yeah. You get Eyeball Boy. Sonic. <laughs> get Jim Belushi. Yeah. Sonic. Which one we call like Big Sonic. Boy? Is this one Big Boy? He is the big. He is the big one. Yeah, this one of them that's just big, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that one. It's just this guy. He's the one with the one with double like double health. Yeah, He's big. Just big. I do remember though, um, my excitement of like, cause you got, I believe you get the esoteric formula in Blood on the Altar, and then like being like, what the heck's that gonna do when we had to wait like a month before the next one? Yeah. Man, I remember when. That felt bad. They, we, we, had to, we had to wait a month, and then we were like, this new release format came up, and like, oh, we're going to have to wait less, and we haven't heard anything for, for months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping that yeah. this is just a one-time thing, that as they're sorting things out and getting the re-releases done, I'm hoping they're going to be a bit more active in the future, but who knows. That would be nice. That would be nice. It would be. Um, yeah, I have nothing else to say about this one. If you if you guys are good to move on to the other one that I have nothing to say about, I'm happy about that too. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean the one the one where they've actually got like 900 cards in the deck? Mm -hmm. So what's the next one, Travis? We're doing weights. Uh, the previous one also had this bird, but I'm just showing this bird here because he's kind of a guy. He's kind Kinda, of. Kinda, yeah. Yeah, this one's like the climb to the top of the hill, and it yeah. takes forever, and it's hard. And sometimes it's really easy, though, because. Because you draw the easy uh, stuff. You draw the easy half the deck. Yeah. And then sometimes yeah. the final boss just falls into a pit. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then you're like, oh, I guess we'll just grab these clues and go. And also, like, the agendas have, like, a million doom threshold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This no, one... this is pretty un unnotable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, Sorry, just, it's just, this one's just kind of not fun. Like, either you draw enough of one of the encounter sets that the game gets to do something, or you don't. Yeah. And, man, if I and had a nickel... just like... Yeah. Sorry. Cool. And if I had a nickel, Bryn, for every time you said, we're not going to shuffle these locations because we don't know, we haven't flipped any of them, I'd have, like, 25 cents. Like, <laughs> I, that happens so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, random is random still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, the last scenario is really good. This one can be the last scenario. It can be, yeah. 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 Honestly, yep. um, I think that there should be one of my favorite things. And, like, even though 
it can really ruin someone's day. My favorite thing is the unspeakable oath, how you can just have your investigator eliminated. I think we need to have more story ends, and then, like, everyone's just like, all right. Because if you're really upset, just play the scenario again, right? But, like, the people who want that to end their story, they should just have more hard ends, I think. Because, number one, it's hard to lose now. And number two... It's more fun to have these stressful choke points that if you do want to actually have your thing, your, like, story end, they allow you to have your story end. Mm -hmm. But what's the I last scenario that. called, I Travis? Like uh, our last one is Lost in Time and Space. Wow. This one's, like, real good. Yeah. It's very stressful, too. It's fun. I like the... As the as reality is like as like different like dimensions and locations are opening around you and closing around you, all while you're trying to get to the edge of the universe to escape and all that. It's just a cool. Then you find the tear through yep. time. It's just a really cool scenario. Yeah. And then like Yogg Saw that's, that's, that's a lot of tips. Yeah, he has five brain damage. It's crazy. And he doesn't deal you horror, he discards the top cards of your deck. And he can just drive you insane. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually one of those yeah, things. Was... Oh, sorry? Yeah, go ahead. No, it, go. It's one of those things, too, that, like, um, this one really feels like you're fighting an ancient one. This one and Azathoth are the ones that, like, really feel like an ancient one. Um, you obviously get some sort of leeway with Yig because Yig is very weak in the kind of thing like he's always just been like the punching bag except an eldritch and then like but then you look at some of the other ones you get like like i mean like we literally bullied uh mother hydra and father <laughs> dagon right like we literally just yeah. like gave them fucking purple nurples uh and like while has like haster is really cool um and like achlanaka is really cool and neralathotep's also really cool I don't think they hit in the same way that Yogg and especially Azathoth hit. Like, they hit different. Because they're just, like, there. And they don't seem to yeah, care about Yeah, they're, like, working you. against you. They just kind of exist. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time. It's a, it's a good good final scenario. Like, I think, like, the, the, uh, the high points of... Uh, Essex, Blood on the Altar, and Lost in Time and Space are just like are just good times. They're just good, good scenarios. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. Sweet. Do we have time to talk about the player cards too? Heck yeah! Yeah, let's go to the player cards. Yeah, so you have five new investigators in this, and they're all very similar deck building. They all get level zero to five for their colors, and uh, up to five level zero cards in any color. Yeah, um, Zoe up on the screen right now. Yeah, and this one also brought up Mister Deduction himself, Rex Murphy. And then, this one also kind of, like, this is especially, too, when, when Bryn was having his moment of playing the rogue without good cards, <laughs> Seeker is just walking over here with higher education. Mm -hmm. Being like, I can do anything. <laughs> like, I mean, like, this isn't anything, but, like, this was just so powerful compared to other stuff. It's kind of nuts. Only a little bit. Yeah. Really good against the brood of Yogg Sothoth. Yeah. True. Uh, what do you think of the style for these um, investigators? Where do they sit on your deck building like uh, tier list? Uh, I think they're a great choice for the start of the game because they we'd be kind of disappointed if they came with them down. Probably, mm -hmm. they're a great choice at the start as. They uh, they have nice, easy deck building. Yeah. 
and it's flexible. You can play the cards that you like from other classes. Um, yeah, I, I would say that they're they're pretty middle of the road. Being yeah. said, they're like a little bit limited. They're a little boring because of the lack of. Um, like you only have one color's worth of cards. Mm -hmm. Their effects aren't don't lead them down particularly any archetype or niche. Yeah. So, I think what does make it fun though is like um, as the card pool grows and we get stuff that's like um, like some of the permanent things, right? That like are like color like that you can just have those and they can kind of like even not those permanent things. Like you can do kind of like your five splash cards can be really unique. They don't just have to be shortcut and luckies, right? Like you could do something fun with it, which I think is interesting. But yeah, when it comes to the upgrade and you're kind of just like, I'm I'm Harvey Walters. <laughs> it's yeah. just like I'm just I'm just a seeker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh any notable player cards that like you really like obviously there's it, it, like for people too if you just got this uh the box like you're gonna get a bunch of staples like there's a lot of yeah. good cards in this set i always forget the shortcut is not a part of the core set mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> always yeah I feel like every time it gets brought up yeah because there's also there's the, as we said earlier prepared for the worst um I'm going to grab my binder because that's going to help me. No, my binders aren't split up by set. What the frick am I doing? I'm going to sit back down. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Justin. Got him. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what, like, survivor cards. Um, let me get Travis's spreadsheet up. Travis has a helpful cheat This one's sheet. got, like, a couple that you like a lot. I'm I'm genuinely surprised you can't think of any of the, kit, of the red cards from this well, I know it's it has like, Pete Sylvester. I know that. Yeah, okay, good. It has Fire Axe. It has Dark Horse. Like, it has, like, those, like, staples. I'm just trying to see, like, outside of that. It uh, has, like... Yeah. yeah, like, so it has, like, like for, like, the big thing, too, is, like, it has the Dark Horse archetype, right? So let me get Dark Horse up on the screen for people who might not know what that is. So Dark Horse, that's Rex Murphy. That's Dark Horse. You mean you can do Dark Horse Rex Murphy now. It's a good time. But, um... <laughs> Like, so, like, it has a whole archetype. It, of course, has Mr. Peter Sylvester, which is, like, you know, there's the running joke that he was my boyfriend. We're seeing other people now, but we st we're, we're still friends. We still talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a running joke because he's really fast. He is very fast. He is. He is. <laughs> yeah. Um, what other notable cards from this one? There's also Aquina. She existed here. Poor Aquina. Is she notable, though? She's notable in She's how like not notable bad. she is. <laughs> I do want to play her in a Daniela deck, though. That's still something I want to do. Just to try uh, something else. Uh, and then they have also... What else did they have? This was the first time where we also saw, like, the... The Strange Solution. The first time when this was spoiled and we had no idea what this was going to do was so exciting. <laughs> Yep. yep. And yeah, I do. I am a little sad that the new release structure means that won't happen again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I don't have to track down six different little plastic. Yeah. <laughs> boxes full of cards. Anymore. Throw away like forty yeah. percent of the box. Yeah, like forty yeah. percent of it. Yeah. Um. Pathfinder was here. As, there's a lot of great cards in this box. Like, if you've just, like... Honestly, this new release thing is a godsend to new players. What about the Guardian stuff? Brother Xavier's notable. The Lightning Gun's fun. Prepared for the worst, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pathfinder really should have been a green card. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the yeah, the the seeker council has spoken and has decided no. <laughs> okay. I mean I I I think 
I mean, we've... We can't have every podcast, in quotes, that we do devolve into just how strong Seeker is. <laughs> Are you sure? It could. We could. I mean, this, like, I think they could. This one, this, <laughs> this campaign made a pretty good case for it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just going through the mystic cards. Yeah. You make a seeking the first time, which was huge when it came out because it wasn't in the core set. The which one? The right of seeking. Yes. And the upgrade shrivelings were really good. Yep. Yeah, you actually had like things to upgrade into his purple. Yeah. And like charisma was huge. You used to fight over. Yeah, I was just about to yeah. Charisma <laughs> was gigantic like that was that yeah. was a, that was a, a pretty big get and then there was also like relic hunter obviously which when it mm -hmm. came out there was actually a long time where like you just never ran it right um yeah but now it's actually like a really good pickup which is exciting yeah yeah back then there were also very few things you could do with it like yep. do you want to play the do you want to pay three xp in your deck so then you can have two holy rosaries if you manage to drop both of them before the end of the game Mm -hmm. right. and you're like no I'll just play Charisma to play the all the allies I got in this campaign thank you yeah. very much though <laughs> yeah we're, we're good we'll buy Charlie Kane yeah yeah go through this a little more time oh yeah the Red Glove Man I always forget the Red Glove Man for some reason I feel like he's in Carcosa but no he's in Dunwich too <laughs> No, he's just in Dunwich, actually. Yeah. Fun fact, he's the easiest character to cosplay out of a lot of them. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, it's... Uh, even if, like, at this point now, with where I sit for what I think of the campaign, um, the player cards are absolute bangers. And it's worthy of picking up the box. Even, I guess, like, it would even be my first recommendation, too, just because, number one, the campaign works well for your first campaign, and number two, because the player, car player card says just as so many good staples that appear in, like, whenever we do an expanded guide, like, car Core Set and Dunwich are basically just, like, here's a staple video. You can find it down in the description. Here's a staple video. You can find it down in the description. Yep. Sweet. Do you have any, guys anything else to say, or should we close this one out? I think I'm good. Yeah, I think I'm done, too. Sweet. All right, well, thank you so much for everybody who watched this video. Uh, if you want to see us talk about more Arkham stuff in our podcast format, let us know in the comments. We will eventually get to Path to Carcosa once that box hits the shelves. Um, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one, and as always... GG's.